ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Coventry Cathedral this evening. Um, it's wonderful to see such a packed space uh, for this Lord Mayor's Peace Committee annual lecture. Um, my name is John Whitcomb, as uh, many of you will know, uh, the Dean here in the Cathedral. Uh, and it's been such a joy to share over the last two or three days with the Rising programme. We've had a fantastic range of speakers, as always. Um, uh, in that collaboration between uh, the Cathedral, the City Council, and of course driven and led and organised from the Tr Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University. So congratulations to uh, Professor Mike Hardy and uh, Richard Dixon and those working with them to bring such a fabulous uh, collection of speakers here to the Cathedral. And I think I'm right in saying that you can access all of the, all of the talks online. So uh, yes, you can. So if, if as you have to see uh, copies of the programme around the cathedral and you see things that you wish that you'd seen then um, please do access those um, uh, so um, seeing our, our friend uh, Pavel um, reminds me that the Ukrainian art auction there are still things for sale um, online if you weren't able to come to the auction if you weren't able to come to the auction or if you did and you want to donate to that then uh, please can we encourage you to do that uh, for humanitarian relief in Ukraine as well so uh, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome uh, all of you here for the, to the cathedral this evening. I'm going to hand over to our Lord Mayor, um, uh, who is going to formally welcome uh, you to the event this evening. <clears throat> There's a couple more chairs here. Yes, I've got. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you to the Dean for doing the advert that I was asked to do before, which is to highlight the fact that we had a, uh, uh, an event yesterday uh, auctioning Ukrainian art for Ukraine. So, Pavel, who is over there, who's going to wave, if uh, anybody's interested in finding out more, please have a word with him. Um, but I'm very pleased, and first of all, to be able to thank all the organizers of tonight's lecture uh, and to introduce Roger, who is going to be able to uh, stimulate and possibly controversially suggest some things. And then we are moving on to a question and answer session later. Uh, so big thanks to Roger for coming along. and. Uh, being able to provide the lecture this evening. I hope you will all be fascinated uh, and uh, hopefully you're storing up your questions for the question and answer session later. So thank you. But without more ado, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Can I just say there's one, two, three, four, five, at least five seats down the front, so do come and populate this space so it's less scary for me. Yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? Um, I feel very much at home here in this building. It's one of my favorite buildings in the whole world. And I don't know if you've done this or not, but I have my particular way of entering the building. Uh, when I come here, I come back to Coventry, I'm from Coventry, a Coventry family. When I come back, I come in through the front doors and I avoid looking to the right and I avoid looking at the baptistry window. And then I turn left and I go up the steps to the Chapel of Unity. And then if the sun is shining, when you descend from the Chapel of Unity, the baptistry window opens before you into a blaze of holy light. It is truly an epiphany. And I really recommend that you take the opportunity if you're coming here again. The first time I, um, I read here, I was, I think, 14 or 15. I don't know quite how it happened, but I was reading at a service of some sort with an absolutely packed cathedral right the way through to the back. And I was sitting right at the back. And in those days, uh, we used to wear, there are some people of a similar vintage in the audience. You will know that uh, people used to wear steel heels or steel edges on the end of their skills, which I believe we used to be called skegs. Anyway, I, I googled skegs to see whether I was right, and I found that um, skegs are an Australian surf and garage rock trio, originally from Byron Bay, New South Wales. So it remains a mystery. Um, my dad worked on this building, on the paving around it and the groundworks. My brother Brian has just completed the pavilion at the rear. Pavilion means toilets, but they're called a pavilion because it's a cathedral, so you can't say toilet. 
Um, so I'm kind of pretty much bedded in this place. Um, the Dean conducted my mother Sylvia's funeral earlier in this year, and thank you to him, and I'll dedicate this lecture to her. Um, later on, I'll touch on the role of climate change in threatening peace in many regions of the world. I'm also going to tackle the question whether technology can combat climate change. You know, we've had huge advances in wind, solar, electric cars, heat pumps, jet fuel made out of waste. I'll be examining how realistic some of those solutions are. But I'm going to start, and this is most unusual for me because I normally talk off the cuff, but I wrote an article for The Guardian a couple of days ago, which is extremely succinct and kind of, um, will help inform you where I sit on this issue. The headline for The Guardian was Why Weather Extremes Frighten Cycli Cyclists. They too frighten cyclists, but, but I actually meant to say scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody terrifying on a bike there as well. Anyway, um, back in the 1980s when climate research began to really take off, scientists were desperate to retain their credibility as they unraveled the potentially dire consequences of a relatively new phenomenon, global warming. Most journalists, myself included, tiptoed around the subject because no one wanted to lose their reputation by being accused of scaremongering. Over many years, I did examine skeptic uh, arguments that climate change was natural or probably it wouldn't be too bad even there was though there might be human influence. But over the years, the science has steadily become absolutely overwhelming. More and more scientists now are admitting publicly that they are positively scared by recent extremes, such as the floods in Pakistan and West Africa, droughts and heat waves in European cities and, and regions and in East Africa, and rampant melting at the poles. That's not because an increase in extremes wasn't predicted. It was always high on the list of concerns. No, it is the suddenness and ferocity of recent events that's alarming researchers, combined with the ill-defined threat of tipping points where aspects of heating would become unstoppable. Climate computer models have typically projected a fairly consistent but smooth rise in temperatures. It's not that they're wrong, but it seems now that the, clay, that the climate appears to have gone haywire. Even in the UK now, in this week, it looks like we've got new heat records being set in the mildest November we've seen. Much more dramatic was last year's heat phenomenon at the Canadian town of Lytton. I don't know if you remember it, but a dome of trapped heat cranked up temperature to 49.6 Celsius, 49.6 Celsius in Canada, yeah? Wildfires raged, the town was leveled to ashes. When I broke the news to one of the Royal Society's leading members, Professor Sir Brian Hoskins, a climate modeler, at first he didn't believe me. And then he uttered, oh my God, that's really scary. The high temperature itself was shocking enough. Even more amazing was that it beat the previous record by five full degrees. Now, a record would normally be beaten by just a few tenths of a degree, not five degrees. So Brian told me later, and I'm using quotes all the way through this, this is very useful for me, so it's not, this is not me talking, okay? I'm an English graduate, I'm not a scientist, I'm reporting what scientists say. He told me climate models have generally projected very smooth changes, whereas the real world is suffering rapid regional changes. The rise in globally average temperature is a useful metric of how far climate change has got, but it doesn't bring home the message of the likely local and regional impact. So, land warms more than oceans, higher latitudes warm more than low latitudes, especially in winter, the warming is non-uniform, which means that weather changes. Air that is six Celsius warmer can hold 50% more water and generally does. So rainstorms are that much stronger. Sea level rise means storm surges are more devastating. And he said, I've been surprised 
and alarmed at the record temperatures and floods we've been seeing in many places around the world with only 1.1 Celsius of warming, that's globally. Just 1.1 and we've seen all this. And what about the UK's first 40 Celsius day in July? Two years previously, researchers said the chance of that visitation this decade was 100 to 1, and yet we saw it all the same. The small print of that day revealed a truly extraordinary high temperature at Bramham in Yorkshire, breaking the previous record by 6.5 Celsius. So leaving even that, that, that Canadian episode in the shade, that's a terrible pun, not intended. It's just one statistic amongst an avalanche of extreme weather events. They used to be known as natural disasters, but they're now mostly being driven by you, me, and the rest of us living our ordinary, carbon-heavy lives. It's the threat of unstoppable long-term change that most worries Professor Dame Jane Francis, director of the British Antarctic Survey. She's witnessed temperatures in the Antarctic 40 Celsius above the seasonal norm, 40 Celsius above the seasonal norm, and in the Arctic, 30 Celsius above the seasonal norm. Dame Jane was most alarmed by a recent report warning that if the 1.5 Celsius threshold is exceeded, which we all know about, and it's almost inevitable now that it, it will be exceeded, frankly it was probably impossible when it was first set, it could trigger multiple climate tipping points. Abrupt, irreversible, and with highly dangerous impacts. She told me, it's really scary, and there's the scary word. Again, this is not scientists talking, this is, this is, a, new, this is a new phenomenon, scientists talking like this. She said, it seems like some of these trends are already underway. She fears for the future of permafrost, for the ice sheet on Greenland, for Arctic sea ice, and for Antarctica's Thwaites Glacier and Western ice sheet. She says, and she's a geologist, these multiple effects will affect the whole planet as well as local inhabitants. As a geologist, she looks back in time for clues about our Earth with its inflated CO2 level of around 430 parts per million at the moment. She warns the last time the planet saw 400 parts per million CO2 was three to four million years ago during the Pliocene when global sea, level rise, sea levels were 10 to 20 meters higher and temperatures two to three Celsius higher. These changes happened over millions of years. Now it looks like we're forcing similar changes on our planet in far shorter time spans. Meanwhile, for most people, the crisis is manifesting itself in weather extremes. North America and Europe suffered their own self-inflicted climate wounds with searing heat records and wildfires. In California, record rainfall failed to quench the desiccating effects of years of drought. <clears throat> Florida, whose Republican governor and presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis voted against climate change policies, has been begging Washington for cash after a hurricane tore around the state. There's been heavy loss of life from floods in Nigeria, and Europe's own summer brought relentless heat with motorways in France closed as forest fires raged. Wildfires also ravaged Spain, Portugal and Greece. Northern Italy looks likely to lose up to half its farm output due to a drought which dried up sections of the nation's longest river, the Po. <coughs> Excuse me. A friend of ours emailed me from Northern Italy to say they'd suffered 40 degree temperatures day after day. The whole landscape had shriveled to brown. <coughs> and she said, very tellingly, short email phrase, it feels like we're dying. It feels like we're dying. So here we are with COP22 <coughs> underway in Egypt. World Meteorological Organization saying the last eight years of the hottest eight on, re eight on record. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide all at record levels, sea level rising twice as fast as 30 years ago. The Antarctic sea ice level fell to its lowest on record. And remember all this again, I go back to this point, <clears throat> this is just with 1.1 Celsius warming, will shortly crash, crash through the 1.5 threshold. 
and unless much more radical action is taken, we're heading for something between two and three. I don't want to be too specific about these numbers. I think often there's a, a spurious specificity to, to numbers. They're best estimates, you know, and you should take them, you should take them as, as estimates, as a feeling, rather than as a hard number. Anyway, <clears throat> the point is that scientists are urging politicians not to find out what a two Celsius te temperature rise looks like, or feels like for that matter. Meanwhile, they're also frustrated by the limitations of their knowledge. Professor Richard Allen, a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the kind of Bible of climate change, told me climate change is only going to get worse. 1.5 Celsius rise globally will be much worse than now. Not worse, but much worse than now. And these are people, they're not prone to hyperbole. When you get down to local scales, he said, we're getting extremes that the models can't capture, including droughts and floods. It's these events that are really difficult to picture. So, the scientists are in a bind. They are sure that things will get worse. They don't know exactly when and exactly by how much. They know if they appear to be campaigning, they could lose credibility. But on the other hand, increasing numbers of them are so alarmed that they are trying to strike different notes to jolt politicians and the public. Another former IPCC lead author, Professor Piers Forster from Leeds, told me, I've tried to change the way I communicate to make it more personal and emotional. Maybe people will act on it more. Extreme impacts are bad now, and they are going to get a whole lot worse. But then you need to give people hope, and you need to give ourselves, as scientists, hope. So why am I talking about extreme weather in a peace lecture? Well, it's pretty obvious, really, because famines, droughts, floods, and searing heat devastate crops and homes and send millions of people on the move to other countries or other areas where they often come into conflict with people who do not welcome visitors. Of the 30.6 million people displaced across 135 countries in 2017, 60% were as a direct result of disasters. I would be willing to, debt that, to, to bet that up-to-date numbers would show far higher figures than, they, than those. It's predicted that Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America could see more than 140 million people moving within their country's borders by 2050. I saw one forecast recently suggesting that by the turn of the century, if things carry on in this way, billions of people will be on the move because their lands will be so hot and dry they will be impossible to live in and they will not be able to grow their food. Food production, according to the UN, will have to, <coughs> have to rise 60% by 2050 just to keep pace with expected global population rise and changing demand in what we eat. And climate change comes on top of that. The annual production gains we've come to expect will be taken away in many places by climate change. We'll have very hot nights, we'll have fewer cool days and more heat waves and storms and floods. They'll all threaten crops. The World Bank said, we're worried about the vulnerability of the one billion people who are already without food and who will be hardest hit by climate change. They have no capacity to adapt. It sounds bleak, but scientists say, and continue to say, we can slow the weight, the rate of warming immediately if we do it now. Casting our hands up and saying this is too difficult, I think, is not an option. It's not an option for us, it's certainly not an option for our children and our grandchildren. So how can we do it? Well, I guess if you're in this room, you probably know how to do it. You know, fly less, drive less, eat less meat, turn down your eating, insulate your home, wear a jumper or two and a hat like I do. Uh, when you're severely challenged on top, you do need a bit of warming when you're standing in front of the computer. There's loads of things uh, we can do. Lobby your politicians if you're concerned about it. Subscribe to an environment group. So many things we can do. One thing that I have tried to press over, over recent years is the fact that we look around and we see what appear to be the climate change villains, the cars, the planes, the gas boilers, the, all that stuff. And we kind of blame them and think, well, if we could solve them, we'd solve climate change. But the truth is that there is another huge cause 
of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, and that is uh, industry, and industries making the materials all around us, the bricks, the concrete, the steel, the plastics, the paper and card, all that sort of stuff. I mean, between them, the top five polluting industries pollute more than all transport put together across the world. Most people don't know that. And I've been struggling to find a way of how we talk about, it. the scientists call it embodied carbon, the carbon that gets released in making materials. I've been trying to, for many years, to try to bring this to the public, but it's really difficult. There aren't good pictures. Television in, uh, editors are not interested. It sounds a bit obscure. And you, they say, what are you going to show me? And you say, well, I'm going to show you this concrete block, and here's a brick, and then, you know, they fall asleep. So. Um, you know, you have to find new ways of doing things. So I'd like to share with you now, this is a bit unorthodox, but I'm gonna break off talking, probably just as well the way my voice is going, break off talking and I'm gonna play you a documentary that I made, my swan song for the BBC. I hope you enjoy it. And it's my attempt to, to kind of bring some life into this debate about embodied carbon. So we'll see the documentary first, then I'll make a few closing remarks, and then we'll take some, some questions and answers. So if the AV people could press the button go, that would be great. Thank you. The power of invention will protect us from climate catastrophe, say the optimists. Smart technologies will reduce the clouds of carbon dioxide emissions from the industries that make the materials surrounding us. At least, that's the hope. I'm now going to introduce you to an invention that is so bold, so brilliant and so extraordinary that you will think it is a trick. You hear that sound? That's the sound of ink coming out of the page. But can carbon cutting inventions be developed in time? Are you sure this is safe, yeah? It's safe. Safe, okay. So here we go. And can art help to draw attention to the challenges ahead? We've been using car panels and various scrap bits of metal that have become this beautiful bit of work, which is just fantastic. I'm Roger Harabin, the BBC's environment analyst. For 30 years now, I've been raising the issue of climate change. Now, on the verge of leaving the BBC, I'm trying something different. I've invited sculptors to help tell my story for me. And I. My film with the sculptors aims to highlight the vast planet heating emissions from the industries that make the materials we all use. Simon Bingle is lead artist on the project. He's working on a clay model of a concrete sculpture that'll be on display at Cornwall's eco-attraction, the Eden Project. The cement industry is one of the world's worst carbon dioxide polluters, along with steel, plastics, aluminium and paper and card. Cement is obviously a very polluting product uh, in its manufacture, as well as being a wonderful material and responsible for some of the fantastic buildings and our infrastructure. But we have to be conscious of the amount of carbon it produces in its production. And just seeing the way we're just ravaging the world for our consumption just revolts me. And we're just going the wrong direction as far as I can see. Not only are we denuding the world of all its wonderful fauna and flora, but actually I see there are going to be great social problems if we carry on in this path. Cement is the key ingredient in concrete, a vital material. But the cement industry globally produces two and a half billion tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. So major firms are trying to cut emissions from concrete by swapping the cement for other low CO2 ingredients that will still have the same effect. So here's guessing game time. One of these mixtures is 100% cement, the traditional way, and the other is 50% cement and 50% other materials. They are just as strong as each other, exactly the same from the point of view of function, except one produces far lower carbon emissions. And the truth is, I can't remember which is which. 
we see that climate change is the biggest challenge facing humanity and as the cement industry we need to meet that challenge and we've set ourselves some very key um, targets so that we can bring as CEMEX we can bring net zero CO2 in concrete globally by 2050. Do you really believe that that's possible? Absolutely. We believe we can do it. We're already making significant progress, uh, not just here in the UK, but globally in all the different countries that we operate in. Some low-carbon cement will be used by the rail firm HS2 here in the Chiltern Hills, northwest of London. HS2 is massively controversial. Some experts say it's not needed at all. Locals hate it because of the noise, the disruption, and the impact it has on some of southern England's finest countryside. And environmentalists don't like it because of the steel and cement involved and all the carbon dioxide that entails. Now, HS2 is trying to make amends with the help of a sandwich, a very big sandwich. Here's an animation showing what a stretch of the raised track will look like. It'll be made with an innovative sandwich of cement and steel. The design enhances the properties of both materials, so building the viaduct uses less of both. So we're saving 7,500 tonnes of embodied carbon in this structure, which approximately halves uh, the embodied carbon compared to a conventional box girder. That's fantastic. It's extraordinary. I mean, I would say that it's, it's not only because of this structural form, but it's largely because of it. We're also doing some other things with the, with the design of this viaduct to minimise the embodied carbon. In the UK, we have a law which says that we are committed to having zero emissions in 2050. The question is, how are we going to get there? This is Professor Julian Allwood. He's a world expert on low carbon materials. We'll hear from him throughout the film. He's optimistic about tackling the climate crisis, but he says the cement industry is a long way off zero carbon. He is a fan, though, of the concrete sandwich. Thanks very much for watching. Sandwich structures use the fact that steel is as strong in tension as it is in compression. So you put the steel where you need tension and concrete where you only need compression. And that gives you overall a more efficient structure. Kadisha Coakley, based at Sheffield Hallam University, is another of our sculptors for the Art of Cutting Carbon project. She's modeling a mask out of recycled and reused steel. The world's steel industry emits as much carbon dioxide as all the carbon producing emissions in the entire Indian economy. Well, in terms of um, the aesthetic, it is taken from African sculpture um, and so specifically from the Mabula Nagula, which is um, no, also known as the Kota Reliquy. The techniques and the um, materials that are often used in that type of sculpture, I'm hoping will resonate with ethnic minorities and other groups in terms of familiarity and the way that we tend to be resourceful, but unknowingly so in terms of how we receive cycle and how we reuse um, our things that we come into contact with um, and a prime example for that is African sculpture and how they reuse and repurpose materials. Steel is a massive polluter partly from the energy needed to raise temperatures to 1500 Celsius but also because steel is formed by baking iron along with coke a fuel derived from coal. That baking process creates even more CO2 emissions. In Luleå in northern Sweden, there's a world-leading breakthrough in the quest for zero carbon steel. This is the current technology. Okay, so Monica, what's, what's going on here? Uh, this is actually the blast furnace. We're trapping the blast furnace with hot metal. So the hot metal goes down to a rail car and we will take it to the steel plant to make steel out of it. And how hot is this? About 1500 degrees. Wow, it's awesome. Yes, <laughs> wonderful actually. This is our technique that we've been using since 2000. But in 2030, we will have a completely new process and we will actually close down this blast furnace. 
We drove a short distance to the demonstration plant making the steel without CO2 emissions. First step is to harness Sweden's copious supplies of wind and hydropower to supply the heat. But the big breakthrough lies here. These are electrolyzers using clean energy to split water molecules and release hydrogen that will be used to help to make the clean steel. Then we plunged underground to see where the precious hydrogen will be stored in what's said to be the world's first cave specially excavated to contain hydrogen at high pressure. The gas held here will be used in the planned zero carbon steel plant. In the chemical reaction to transform iron ore into steel, the hydrogen will replace dirty coke. This novel reaction with iron and hydrogen instead of iron and coke will have only one byproduct, and that is water. We're about to witness a very special sight mounds of iron pellets transformed by the hydrogen. I mean, this is really the kind of revolution with this technology that we're seeing what goes in and what comes out, and this has been made using no coke whatsoever. It's using only hydrogen from fossil free electricity. And to our knowledge, this is the first time in the world that anyone has done this. And this is then further processed into steel, which we have also tried. So this is a piece of the first fossil free steel made in the world. It's revolutionary. Indeed. In just a decade, this gargantuan plant will close to be replaced by another plant making fossil free steel. Now in 35 years reporting the environment, I think this is one of the most significant technological advances I've seen. Volvo is already running demonstration trucks made from the zero carbon steel. And the steel maker's order book is overwhelmed by demand. The hydrogen plant in Sweden is really exciting as the first big scale demonstration of that approach. The difficulty is whether it will scale to global level and scaling it needs an enormous supply of emissions free electricity. They happen to have that in Sweden but the rest of the world doesn't. Only a third of our electricity doesn't have emissions. So if we do choose that route we're only going to be able to make about a tenth of the amount of steel that we make today. In Liverpool, Gina Czarnecki is designing a 3D printed sculpture made from plastic for the art of cutting carbon. She's been trying to make it from a plant-based plastic, but she's struggled to source the materials. To her, plastic is a menace. I was particularly drawn to this project because I'm, I'm, uh, I've been working a while in plastics or the idea of an anti-plastic, an alternative to plastic, and I got more and more aware of the toxicity of some of the materials that we take for granted and the traditions poisoning the planet and being really unsustainable. And we need to bring this to immediate attention of, you know, to to everybody, to kids in play parks, to adults who go shopping. You know, this, this has to be a kind of number one for everybody at the moment. The horror of beaches covered in plastic waste has caught the public's attention. But there's another hidden plastic problem. Plastics are almost all made from heavily polluting oil and gas. Drilling creates lots of carbon dioxide emissions and the plastic industry is said to be the third worst CO2 polluter on the planet. But forget oil and gas. What if you could grow the raw material for plastics? Try wheat and sweet corn. That's what they're doing at this plant in the Netherlands, in another world first. This is a sugar derived from crops. It'll be transformed into clear bioplastic suitable for soft drinks bottles. I'm just going to give it a little taste. Are you sure this is safe, yeah? It's safe. It's safe, okay. So here we go. It's sugar, just plain ordinary sugar. And this is going to become a plastic bottle one day. Yes, at the end it will it's be. Fa yeah. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Look at the array of products they can make from the powder I've just eaten. 
Yeah, the breakthrough, of course, is, is not starting from fossil carbon, like from petroleum, but starting from plant-based sugars and turning that into a plastic material that you can use to contain food, to contain beverages. And I think the exciting part here is not only something that is better from a sustainability perspective, but it is also something which has real great performance for packaging. Yeah, it is really something that will have massive changes across the globe in all kinds of different uh, applications. What sort of applications do you think? Well, we are now primarily interested in looking at packaging. So we're looking at the beverages industry, so bottling. But ultimately, you also have to think about clothing and you know, all kinds of uh, fabric and textiles, which is everywhere in your home. So we could be storing our food in sugar and wearing sugar. Yes, exactly. But this exciting innovation won't do much in the short term to cut carbon dioxide emissions. Only 1% of all plastic now is based on plants. With a fair wind in five years, it could be up to 2%. They've got a problem that you make plastic as a, um, in parallel with making petrol from oil. And the two processes are so coupled together that they're very uh, efficient, um, but therefore anything else is having to compete against something where the costs are already very low. So making bioplastic is a more expensive process, but actually the big problem is a different one. If we don't act on climate change, we're going to run out of food. Our numbers say that by the end of this century, probably a billion people are going to starve in countries near the equator because we won't have enough food. So we just aren't going to have spare biomass around for making a vast volume of bioplastic. Meanwhile, in North London, Simon Bingle's designing another figure, this time in paper and card. Paper is another one of the world's biggest CO2 emitting industries. My cardboard sculpture is hopefully representing the avalanche, the torrent of cardboard that comes pouring through our doors every day. Uh, there's a vast quantity of paper used, trees, and we need to be aware of how much we're using. It's a fantastic material, like many of the materials we're depicting, uh, but we need to be cautious about the volumes that we're using and where the material is sourced from. Paper and pulp is made on a gargantuan scale. Countless trees are felled from the world's great forests. This plant is in Sweden. Let me give you an idea of the vast scale of this place. The paper mill gobbles up trees so fast that all this lot is going to last just 10 days. 10 days. The plants run by Billerud Korsnas, which aims to go carbon neutral soon, partly by burning its own waste for fuel. But not all timber operations can achieve that, so we really need to cut the amount of paper and card we use. We're simply consuming too much stuff. It's a terrible habit. We've got to kick it. Half the energy used by that industry still comes from fossil fuels, so they are causing emissions like all the other major materials producers. And amazingly, demand for paper is still going up. After 50 years of talking about the paperless office, we haven't got there. Um, so we could change that by changing the amount of paper and packaging that we're all using. I'm now going to introduce you to an invention that is so bold, so brilliant and so extraordinary that you will think it is a trick. It isn't a trick. This is real. It's to do with solving the problem of what we can do with all the waste paper in the world, all the paper we print up and then just throw away. Well, in here, there's a machine that's going to wipe the words off the page. Yes, really. This is Barak Yakutieli who's behind the project. Barak, we've got some printed paper here. Can you wipe those words off the page, please? Absolutely, Roger. It's done with a powerful laser and a special paper coating that stops ink soaking into the page. Each sheet can be reused up to 10 times. And look at the transformation. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. Barak, what have you done with the words? 
Well, we basically evaporated the ink, and what's left is just pigments of the ink, which we collect, and those can be recycled back into new printer inks. So you vaporized the script? Completely. So how's this going to become an everyday part of office life? Well, basically, we're taking the technology you see here, which is basically the printing, laser to printing technology, and we integrate it into existing types of printers. And then you could just buy one, basically, or buy the service. So there's like a standard photocopy and there'll be a bit of a bolt-on for your kit? Uh, we're converting existing printers with our solution. So we have a printer and then you have a deep printer that could sit next to every printer and work with every printer in the world. The last of the big five polluting industries is aluminium. It's dragged from bauxite using vast amounts of heat. Some firms are using power from renewables such as wind and hydro. But the process of making aluminium worldwide still creates as much CO2 as the whole of the UK produces. John Jostins in central England is an eco-designer for cars. He's been dreaming up an aluminium sculpture for the Art of Cutting Carbon exhibition. This, this is a very interesting project on many fronts and um, in particular it's a creative act and it's a creative act of, of, of making a piece of sculpture. I am a fine artist, I'm a, a, a maker um, at root. Of course I'm working in sort of eco vehicle industry and all my creativity has to go go down that route but this is a fantastic opportunity to to unpack some of those other latent creativities that I've got going on in, inside me. John worked on the Star Wars robot R2-D2 in a previous career. Now he focuses on making lightweight hydrogen vehicles that minimize the use of materials such as aluminium. A normal car, something goes wrong, the service center says, sorry sir, scrap it, it's not worth keeping. With our vehicles, quite different, a modular approach which allows us to remanufacture key assemblies within the vehicle to extend the overall vehicle life to something like 20 years. So show me. So this is a battery pack uh, made of aluminium and this is a fuel cell here. Both these items have got serviceable items inside them which can be changed as and when they wear out, rebuilt, put back in the car and go on for a further life. So, so that doesn't need any new aluminium? Doesn't need any new aluminium, I need a changed battery cell or a fuel cell or a pump or something like that but broadly um, these can be remanufactured quite simply because they're easily accessible. Reuse is really good if you can reuse the whole product, but it's very difficult if you're using components within an assembly because the cost of disassembling and putting it back together is very high, but also the other components around it are being innovated and changing. So it's very difficult to keep components going over multiple product lifespans. 75% of aluminium does get recycled, but even melting it takes a lot of electricity. In Dortmund in Germany, they're developing a low energy form of recycling. It involves taking a block of aluminium, then feeding it into a machine. The machine warms the metal, then squeezes it to produce a tube. Separate equipment produces useful aluminium sheet. We've seen brilliant innovations in this film so far. Firms in many industries worldwide are striving to go low carbon through technology and others are likely to fall in line if governments set them targets. But Professor Allwood says that won't itself solve the climate crisis. I am optimistic, but it depends on us choosing to use today's technologies differently rather than believing that a magic bean is going to drop out of the technical innovation world and suddenly scale at global level. Everything that matters here is about scale. Doing something once in a lab doesn't matter. Doing something that we can all do and change is what we have to do. This film has been doing things differently. A wake-up call through journalism and sculpture combined about cutting emissions by creating less material. Here at the Eden Project, a special gallery will house the sculptures. Kadisha's administering the finishing touches to her piece. I quite like that. We've been using car panels and various scrap bits of metal that have become this beautiful bit of work, which is just fantastic. I could never have imagined it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so I'm really chuffed to see it in, um, in its form. It's great. 
John is hoping the exhibit will help people to see materials differently. I would like them to think that the material that we're using is a, an interesting material, a useful material, and the figures, you know, it's meant to represent a kind of a future life where mobility is simple and it requires only, a, uh, in this case, a single wheel with an electric motor to get you across town. And it's really about that minimalism and super efficient kind of way we can go about our future lives. You know, if we choose, pick and choose materials carefully and what we design and what we make, you know, with those materials, we, we, we there is a, an opportunity here to have a, a much greener life. Simon's concrete figure is arriving. It may be stuffed with waste polystyrene, but it still weighs getting on for half a tonne. Oh, it's light. Gina's plastic figure is easier. It's called Child of Oil Born. John takes a careful knife to unveil his aluminium piece. And swooping from the ceiling is Simon's piratical cardboard catastrophe, spitting cardboard fragments at visitors. The figures will have their own gallery for the next five years. As far as the climate goes, they will be five crucial years. It's been enormous fun working with the artists here at the Eden Project and frankly it has also been a privilege to witness the explosion of human creativity in low carbon solutions for industry. But, and this is a very big but, it is clear that industry has to go much further and much faster than it's doing currently to cut carbon emissions. Humanity has some serious challenges ahead. We simply have to use less stuff. quite emotional standing at the back and watching it. I haven't seen it now for a few months. And that took, goodness knows, so long, so much of my life, but a lovely way to end my career. Uh, great fun. And I should mention, John Jostins, the guy with the aluminium, uh, was a student at Coventry University, Manchester Poly, as it was in those days. A great friend of Jerry Dammers of the specials, who was also coincidentally a friend of mine from school. Uh, and I hunted down John because I knew what he'd been up to. Um, he was a professor. He then became professor of uh, automotive design at Coventry University uh, with a workshop at Parkside, just by Parkside, uh, making those uh, low uh, material cars, the, the tiny little cabs and some micro cabs. Sadly, now we've lost him to all places. Birmingham, I'm very sorry to say. Um, anyway, look, there are clearly signs of optimism in that film. Um, fantastic inventions, great creativity from people. They're not the only signs, of course. You know, China has now said uh, it wants to peak emissions from the cement and steel industry. It's looking at a sectoral approach which is not really caught on in the West. Um, and the Chinese government is trying to drive a sectoral approach. We've had 18 countries cutting emissions for at least 10 years. Um, more fantastic news about renewables now, 80 or 90% cheaper than they were a few years ago. A massive saving of energy and cost from, from LEDs. Uh, Biden still saying he can reduce America's emissions 40% by 2030. Amongst all the heat waves and everything, winter deaths from cold are clearly down. So all these are signs of hope. But, and this is what dogs me, unfortunately, has dogged me in, in my reporting, is just not enough. So the innovation is going on, the policies are going on, but the world is changing extremely fast. And the 2050, you know, phasing out emissions gently by, by 2050, 
to a net zero, not absolute zero, we find some trees to plant. I mean, in my view, it's completely unrealistic. The climate is changing far too fast for that. We can't, we can't afford to take a view that long. And then we're talking now about, recently there was a, a paper on tipping points, uh, what might happen in terms of irreversible changes. Already there's talk about, I mean, the Amazon drying, the Amazon's already in a parlous position. Um, sea ice in the Arctic uh, going fast, boreal forest fires and drying, wide, widespread loss of coral, Greenland ice sheet under threat, Antarctica, ocean circulations also under threat. And I see no signs that governments are really taking this seriously. They're treating it as a something else, business as usual, but actually this is not a business as usual issue. This is, I believe, a planetary emergency and we need to treat it as though it were an emergency. I want to end with a quote, a rather dismal quote, I'm afraid, but very apposite, from the 19th century historian, Leopold von Ranke. Now, I don't read much 19th century history, and I nicked that as a quote from the Times about something completely different. But never mind, it's highly apposite. This is the quote from Leopold von Ranke. People and governments are seldom undone by blindness or ignorance they soon realize where the path they have chosen is leading them. But there is an impulse in them which they do not resist. It continues to propel them forward. Most see their ruin before their eyes, but they go on into it. He who overcomes himself is divine. What an appropriate way to end address the cathedral. I'm very happy to take questions and answers. I'm not a technical expert. If you ask me to describe the workings of the West Antarctic ice sheet and its, uh, it, the role it has in holding back on land, on land ice, then I won't know the answer. And I don't know how many millions of tons of emissions are, are given out by uh, Vietnam. So, but I do know quite a lot about policy and what's been happening in the UK and about technology and happy to answer questions on any of those broad points. So I think my role is to spot anybody who's got their hand up and um, ask them to ask a question. So I've got two... Good evening. I, I would like to know how we can best lobby our politicians. Okay, so I've never lobbied a politician in my life, so I probably can't give you very good, uh, very good advice on that. I have used my role as a journalist to consistently bring these things to public attention, and there's, there's good evidence that um, reporting, I mean, I, I've been at the BBC and I, I really strive to be impartial uh, as far as it's possible to be truly impartial. Um, but I, one thing I have done is to try to continue to get this on the agenda. And there's evidence that suggests that people, if, if something is regularly put on the agenda by the media, people use it as a talking point and, and they, you know, they discuss it. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they act on it in, in a good way or bad way, but it's more, uh, it's more brought to their consciousness. So I've had the privilege of being able to do that. If I were an individual, uh, an ordinary BBCless individual, which I now am, I would go along and book, a, book an appointment with my MP uh, and sit, MP surgery and sit down and say, look, I'm really worried about all this stuff. And I don't get yourself armed with facts and go and say, we're not doing enough and we're not doing it fast enough. And if everybody in the room did that, that would make a bit of a difference, possibly. There's a former MP sitting in the room. He might comment on that later. Oh, thank you very much. I thought it was really fascinating. Um, one of the things I was struck by was the idea that, certainly from the film, that a lot of this is, needs to be done by private industry. Whereas I'm far more interested in the state in the sense that a lot of the great scientific and technological projects which have been undertaken in human history from you know the moon landings to the um the creation of the atomic bomb to cern and the large hadron collider all big science which is requires massive state intervention 
and is actually one of the things that we need to do is to convince the politicians that actually we need to treat this as a kind of war kind of project. So obviously things like the advent of the computer comes out of the Second World War, the internet comes out of um, American US military projects, um, the, obviously the uh, atomic power and things like that all come from, from the state as well. So is that actually really where we need to go with this, that it needs to be the, uh, the government investing trillions of dollars in order to really solve this and actually kind of what we're talking about in the film is tinkering around the edges. Okay, I, I mean I think that's an alluring proposition. Um, I can see a few problems with it. What, one is that um, moon landing was incredibly focused. They knew what they wanted to do. They knew it was, you know, said to be impossible in the time scale, but they knew what they wanted to do and everybody was working to a common purpose. If you're trying to tackle climate change, it's so disparate. It's, you know, the carbon story, as I think I've shown in that, is kind of all around us, in, in us. I mean, how many people are wearing shoes with rubber soles? They're not rubber, they're plastic. Plastic is made with oil. You're wearing plastic glasses made out of oil. You know, where do, where do we start? So there are some things. For, you know, I'm from a family of, of builders, for instance. Um, I've been incredibly frustrated by the very poor advances in insulation technology. There's, a, there's a, a gel, a gel substance that you can put on very, very thinly onto rooms. The National Trust are using it to insulate their properties. It's called Aerogel. Uh, and I, I've phoned around and looked, looked on the web. I can't find any knowledge about it at all. It looks like it's just out, out there in the corner of people's knowledge. So instead of taking two inches off your room all the way around to insulate it, you're taking one centimetre off. I mean, that should be front and centre of research programmes from my point of view. The government are actually funding many research programmes and development programmes in industry, but I think it would be, although it's a very tempting proposition, I think it would be hard to, to bring forward one specific programme. Otherwise, what would you tackle? You know? Anyway, don't answer that question because it's somebody else. Hello, Roger. Um, it's just to ask whether you think there is any point in having the COP meetings um, and whether there are any positives coming out of it. Also, this year, uh, I was on the Danube and the water levels had dropped so much that we were lucky to sort of get to where we wanted to be. And I know that some of the ships on the Rhine actually couldn't complete as well. And this is, when you look at the water levels, how much they have dropped, they are huge. You're seeing shores now um, that are like beaches um, on the river side and so on. So, you know, the practical side of things, looking at this and the reality of what is going on in your Europe, there were temperatures of 37 degrees at that time, a huge. But when I look at also at what is going on in Parliament, you read Hazard and the number of times that they've had meaningful discussion, there's very few. Yeah. And the, it's, it's the priority that needs to be made. And I don't know how we get this through because I don't feel that we see COP being very effective. Thank you. Okay, so um, Boris Johnson apparently had a presentation from the government chief scientist a couple of years ago to show him what climate change was really like. Now, I actually believe Boris was already predisposed to take action on, on climate change. Uh, his dad was a former European official on, on the environment. His sister's an environmentalist. He's married to an environmentalist and a bunny hugger. And, you know, he had it in his, in his mind already. I think he was just trying to fend off the right wing of his own party by making crass remarks to divert them and make them think he was on side. Um, but then, uh, more recently, the same people who offered the chief scientist uh, briefing to Boris Johnson have been trying it with the current cabinet and the last cabinet to offer them a briefing. To my knowledge, Rishi Sunak has never had this briefing. Liz Truss certainly it had never got through her head. I mean, I, I spoke to her, uh, when would it have been? She was environment secretary. She came to the BBC. Uh, should I tell this story or not? Um, <laughs> Well, I think so. She's no longer Prime Minister. It's less scary, isn't it? Um, she came to the BBC and she told us about what her environment policies were and we were really struggling to understand. People were just looking at each other, thinking, I don't get this, don't get this. Uh, and then I, I said eventually, Secretary of State, can, can you tell us what your policy is for protecting the environment? She said, deregulation. So then we all looked at each other and, and I said, no, no, what's your policy for protecting the environment? And she said, deregulation. I thought, oh golly, well, that's, you know, we're not going to get very far on this agenda. So when it comes to COP, uh, I've been to many COPs. I absolutely hate them. 
You can't find out what's going on in this particular cop. The food and drink in the main arena apparently ran out on day two, out of day 14. Um, it, they're horrible. You're awake all night trying to find out what happened. You can't find out, and then you have to go on the radio and talk about something you don't know anything about. Um, I remember once being at the Copenhagen cop, which was horrendous, and everything went to pieces in the middle of the night. And um, I was on about two o'clock in the morning on BBC World TV, and the presenter said, you know, now here's our environment analyst, Roger Harabin. Um, Roger, what's, uh, what's happening? And I said, uh, I haven't got the faintest idea. <laughs> so it was a horrible thing to do to a presenter, because it makes your heart stop, you know. You think, ah, what question am I going to ask next? So, so I said, and I said, shall I tell you something even worse? He said, yeah. So I said, um, I've just bumped into Gordon Brown and had a chat with him. He hasn't got the faintest idea. <laughs> so they are, they are horrible. Will it, is it better to go than not to go? I think on balance, yes. It's, it's a way of reciting the creed. It's a way of reaffirming your commitments. There are some meaningful discussions going on uh, in the sidelines, but my big grouse with COP is it's not on, it's not on the right agenda. So, we, we, you know, they're trying to hold it to 1.5. Well, that's lost. But let's try and hold it to 2. I mean, it's, 2 is just ridiculous. We've got 1.1 and all this stuff happening in the world. I do not want to see 2 degrees. But we can't, we can't then start lowering it because that's what the world has agreed. And we can't, or we can't appear to meet the agreements we've already met. So there's no point making it tougher. So I think there's a whole feeling of, not, not of greenwashing, but of a sort of... Kind of Alice in Wonderlandiness about it, if you know what I mean. Okay, gentlemen over. Is there only one microphone? No? Good, yeah. excellent. Thank you so much. My name is Kiza. Uh, you just say that staying, be staying below 1.5 is literally impossible, even per UN report. But also, in, in a few days, probably all weeks, we shall be 8 billion people all over the world. And you, you created a nexus between climate change, but also conflicts. You know, uh, it, there's an, a linkage or a nexus in there. And with that in mind, do you think the UK is doing enough to really put climate change at the center of its policy, mostly in the view of immigration, you know, refugees coming to UK and being sent somewhere else? All these are impacts of climate change, do you think so? And just comment about that. No, I, I don't think the UK is, is doing enough. Opening up new oil and gas fields in the North Sea that won't produce for possibly decades is absolutely um, not in line with the recommendations uh, of international bodies. We shouldn't be striving for any more oil, gas or coal at all. We've already discovered more than we can safely afford to burn. Now, I, I, do, I, do, uh, I do kind of bow to a couple of concerns. One is that, that the environment is not the only question for a government. So the government also considers balance of payments. And if we're getting our own homegrown gas, uh, then we're not having to import gas, which is good for the balance of payments. Also, getting our own homegrown gas uh, produces fewer carbon emissions than getting uh, gas from Qatar or, or the USA, for instance, and compressing it and shipping it over in tankers. So if we're going to continue to burn gas, then it's better to burn our own. And the point is that we shouldn't be continuing to burn, to burn gas. I think that's a, a major failing. It's that the government has major failings on its policies for uh, retrofitting housing and making housing more efficient without which we can't go any further. The progress of electrification of or supply of electricity for cars, uh, electric cars is, is really just ridiculously slow. I mean, there, I could go on. There, there are so many things. I have to say, unfortunately though, the UK is rather better than most, which is this kind of a sad commentary really. We're not getting there. Our target is too low from my point of view and we're not getting there, but still we're better than most. Any more questions? Dave, the XMP that you mentioned in dispatches. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Roger. That was. Uh, so, so, Dave, say who you are. Sorry, um, my name is Dave Nellist. Um, I think I'm the XMP that was uh, referenced earlier on. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. I think um, it was a, a clear message for us all to take away and the film I thought uh, answered the first of the three very brief points I'm going to hang a question around 
in that I don't think the problem we face is technological. I think there's enough brains out there thinking of good ways in which we could decarbonise and move to clean ways of, of, of running things. I actually don't think it's economic either. I mean, the trillions we've spent on rescuing the banks in 2008 and then more recently in the pandemic shows that banks can find money if there's uh, enough of a move to it. I think it's political and I apologise for asking a political question but then again I've been doing it for 50 years so it's a bit late to stop now. In the last 30 years 71% of all greenhouse gas emissions have been the responsibility of 100 private corporations. They're under a legal duty to make the most profit because that's what the shareholders want. Can you see, or in your discussions with uh, people, have you heard that we might actually move more quickly towards a clean future if the main industries which are causing the problem, and in the UK it's transport, it's energy, it's construction, the other industries that you mentioned uh, in your speech and in the film, were actually publicly owned and under a different imperative, an imperative to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions rather than make a profit for private shareholders. So could we meet some of those targets? if we had public planning, rational planning of resources, rather than leaving it to the profit margins of the current owners? I'll be honest, Dave, I, I don't know for certain that it would make a great deal of difference, because what, what it needs to be at core is for the government itself to set down the standards. And I'm not sure that it makes a difference whether the standards should be set to a private industry or to a public industry. I'm not against private, uh, privatisation, nor am I against publicisation or whatever the opposite phrase is. Uh, I think that it comes down to governments to set the targets, and the targets they're setting at the moment are simply not enough. And they have the powers to force companies to, uh, to act, and they're just choosing not to use them. Somebody at the back in an orange. I can only see an arm. I presume there's a body behind it. Um, hello. I'm Sam. Um, um, how much? contamination are we doing um, in the world every day more or less I'm sorry I didn't catch this, that word how much what are we doing how much contamination we're doing an awful lot and I'm kind of glad you asked me that question because my talk has been about carbon dioxide um, we haven't mentioned methane now I realized 25 30 years ago what a massive problem the expansion of ranching into rainforest areas would be. But at the time, I was under very severe attack and consistent attack from people in right-wing newspapers and uh, think tanks um, saying, complaining that I was a, a doomster and a, a you know, campaigner and what have you. And at the time, I was writing about problems with cars and planes and homes and gas boilers and stuff. Uh, and I thought, if I take on farms as well, if I, if I m allow myself to be dismissed as the man who is trying to stop you eating your Sunday roast, then I might actually lose the support of my bosses, and I've been very grateful for the support of my bosses over a long period of time. So I decided not to go along with that. Um, of course, you know, now, now it's well acknowledged that uh, cows produce lots and lots of methane, intensive agriculture, um, big farming produces lots of lots of methane, uh, and then it's not just not just that. I mean, there are other gases too that are heating the world, and then we have the massive massive problem of plastics, um, where we saw on the film the problem of the amount of CO2, a greenhouse gas, produced with the making of plastics. But there's also the massive problem of plastics in the oceans, littering the ocean floor. I did a piece last year or the year before last about plastic in Arctic snow. I, did, I was above the Arctic Circle uh, in the Arctic and it was snowing and researchers were finding that there were fragments of plastic in the snow. 
There are fragments of plastic all over the bottom of the ocean. It's, it, we don't know yet how, how serious a problem it's going to be because we don't know if the plastic is going to be taken up by other organisms. So uh, there's lots of things that, uh, that we should be concerned about. We're not, unfortunately, we're not taking very good care of this planet, I'm very sorry to say, and the animals and creatures and plants and everything that live in it. Should HS2 be scrapped on the grounds it's an environmental disaster? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for several years, HS2 have pinpointed me as their public enemy number one because I have consistently reported about the problems behind it from the environmental point of view. I think HS2 has had a really easy ride. I, I find it absolutely baffling that we've invested so much money and, and still the figures are still going up. We've invested so much money for something which I think will be unnecessary. Um, since HS2 started, we've seen a massive drop in rail usage because of people working from home and we've seen a new, new dispersion of, uh, of work. Uh, and I don't think the passenger numbers will, will come up high enough. I think there were other solutions that we could have done. And the idea of selling it as being good for the north, I mean, it's, it's a great sales trick, but I just really do not believe it will benefit the north. What the north needs is more um, cross-country uh, rail services to help people commute, not, not fast services whizzing people down to London. I absolutely hate it, and it's such a relief for me. I've been in the BBC all these years. I've never been able to say that. I hate HS2. It's, it feels wonderful. <laughs> Actually, I feel I feel rather sad because the film was quite kind to HS2, and it made me feel very uneasy because I really hate it so much. But that's a kind of index of what BBC journalists have to do. Can I say how much I agree with you? Tim Sorden, by the way, I'm a Coventry oh, councillor. Yeah. Um, can I say how much I agree with you over HS2, having spent the afternoon at a friend's farm uh, near Offchurch, uh, watching another huge pile of soil being moved from one place to another for no apparent reason. Uh, my question, though, was simply to say that you could close a steel mill tomorrow or a plastics factory tomorrow but you can't rebuild a tree tomorrow. And I noticed in the newspaper today that um, in Pakistan, and you mentioned the flooding in Pakistan, in 1970, I think 55% of Pakistan consisted of forest. It's now down to 7%. So the issue of deforestation is a very major problem uh, because you simply cannot recreate a tree in the same time that you could save carbon by cutting down um, a, a plastics factory. Or Tim, I, I, factory. I absolutely agree with you. I saw a photograph yesterday. Um, in fact, it was, I was on a panel yesterday with a young journalist from India, and she was saying, look at the Western Ghats. That's down in the south of India. Uh, look at all the terrible erosion here because of the heavy rains. Well, I was in the Western Ghats 20 years ago, and farmers were busy chopping down all the trees as fast as they could. So the truth is, very often, it's a complicated picture. It's climate change and something else. Uh, climate change as, a, you know, as an aggrandizer of, of already uh, events already set in, in chain. And certainly, um, tree planting and tree, uh, tree felling is one of them. It's a massive problem. But then we, you have to, you know, poor people need to cook. And we have to find some way of poor people cooking without chopping down all their trees. How much wars like the invasion of Iraq and the invasion of Ukraine contribute to global warming? I'm so sorry, I missed the start of that. It distorted a bit. How much wars like the invasion of Iraq and yes. the invasion of Ukraine and these bombs and cruise missiles contribute to the problem, 
to the environment. Okay, well, I mean, obviously, wars create a lot of problems by producing explosives and lots of vehicles and lots of vehicle movements, and obviously, so obviously they're highly polluting. In the case of this current war, um, there's been a really interesting phenomenon that the, the fossil fuel lobby who, you know, have very smart people, paid a lot of money, immediately jumped in and said, oh, what we, this means we have to produce all our own gas now. We've got to find lots of other ways of having gas. Well, if that continues, there is going to be a massive surplus of gas worldwide and the price will drop and it will be very difficult to resist the advance of people who want to put gas back into the system. But on the other hand, the tightening of supply of gas from Russia has created an opportunity for policymakers to think, well, actually, do we want to go down the gas route or should we maybe be going something else? And the truth is that in most parts of the world now, solar power and wind power are producing energy, electricity, much more cheaply than gas. That's with a high price and even with a lower price, they will be producing in many parts of the world much more cheaply. So that, that particular war has a, has a kind of a double effect and it's too early yet to say what the final outcome will be, I think. Um, I'd just like to mention that a film called Scarred Lands and Unwounded Lives. Uh, seven years ago in this cathedral, we had a conference called Reconciling a Wounded Planet, and uh, it was about stories of hope for a world in environmental crisis. We had the filmmakers, uh, Alice and Lincoln Day from the States at that particular conference. You can see the whole film on uh, the internet if you just Google Scarred Lands and Wounded Lives. Really worth watching because the uh, impact of war is absolutely tremendous. I mean, wicked and what it does for the carbon thing. But having just said that, I'd like to add that uh, this diocese of Coventry, since that, has really taken on the uh, environmental thing. And uh, we have now one third of our churches signed up for an organization called Eco Church. And if any of you go to churches in this diocese and your church is not a member of that, please see me after the meeting and I'll fix you up. Thank you. Will you be putting solar panels on the roof? I was only, only teasing. Um, is there one more or not? Are we, is there another question or are we giving up? Hello, thank you. Roger, that was brilliant. And I think it's so brilliant, your film, that I believe it should go into schools because it's our young people, they're our future. And if they're inspired by all these new ideas and inventions, maybe they would be inspired to think of even more things. I think the younger people are... They're very conscious about what they eat, what they wear, and they're always on computers. So to have something like this that would fit into, I don't know, into their world, not just tonight, I think it, it's quite wonderful, your film, and all the things that you've done. And I don't know whether you go into schools and colleges and things, but you've got a massive window for us all to look into to see what differences we can make because I think that's, we've got to start with ourselves and if our families and children can force us. Because advertising always appeals to young people, doesn't it? I think. And then they, they then get to the parents for what well, they I want. Mean, please, it's, 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 on BBC, it's on BBC iPlayer. It's called The Art of Cutting Carbon. Pass it round. And, uh, you know, if schools want to watch it, that's fantastic. I think we great. need to encourage it because I think it's brilliant and I think you are. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Edward Garner. Thank you for the talk. Um, left me feeling fairly optimistic. Um, my concern, though, is if we do, as a human species, reach <coughs> net zero, what about the other tipping points? What if um, permafrost is, mel is melting, releasing more methane, uh, forest fires are still burning? So I'm interested in how important carbon sequestering is, um, specifically biological, okay. so plankton. Um, right, so carbon sequestering is where you capture carbon by various means and either use it for something else or like pumping into a greenhouse to encourage plants to grow or into fizzy 
pop bottles or, or what have you, or pumping it into the ground to get caught in a geological formation. So I, I remember uh, first doing something about carbon capture and storage about probably about 20 or maybe 23 years ago, something like that. BP had a new gas field that they were opening in the middle of the Sahara called Insala. And um, there's, there's something called, a phenomenon called dirty gas. And dirty gas is where you bring up methane out of the ground. Methane is what comes through our, our gas tanks, our, through our cookers. Uh, and it's mixed with too much carbon dioxide, so you can't sell it. There's a, there's a maximum amount of CO2 you're allowed to sell with, mixed with your methane, otherwise you can't put it onto the market. So BP realized that at this one plant would be the biggest source of CO2 on the planet, the biggest single source of CO2 on the planet. And they thought, hmm, better think about something else. So they captured, the, they separated the CO2 out from the methane chemically, and they took, the methane, they took the CO2 and they pumped it down into the strata of rock that the natural gas had come out of. So they basically they put it back where it had come from. An absolutely extraordinary technology. Um, the drilling in the middle of the Sahara was controlled by a bloke in Sudbury. He'd got this giant sort of TV screen and he had his, uh, he had his monitor going underneath and digging a hole through the Sahara and getting the gas out. Uh, I believe that BP closed that, uh, that carbon capture and storage plant, and there, there is now a handful of, of plants around the world. The truth is that the economics do not work at the moment, and if politicians want to bring it forward, uh, they'll have to make the economics work. I mean, the, prob the problem for the CCS, carbon capture and storage, is that, is that they've just been massively overtaken by wind and solar. Nobody expected wind and solar to come this fast from a, such a slow beginnings. The CCS is left languishing behind. And, you know, we may need it. Lots of people are convinced that we will need it. But if we want to use it, we have to find a way to pay for it. And at the moment, that way to pay for it does not exist. Okay. So I think it's time to draw this to a close now. Um, can we show our appreciation, please? For I don't know if you've got a few final few words you'd like to say or... Yes, um, I mean, firstly, thank you all for coming here. I hadn't expected nearly this many people. So it's been, it's been great. And I just urge you all to, to go out to try to find some optimism and, uh, and, and, and tell people about the news that actually we really, really are not doing enough. And just get out there and stir things up a bit. Thank you. <laughs>